Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. You know, we live in paradise, but there's the other side of paradise, the fact that so few of our residents are able to afford housing. Well, there's no lack of solutions that are offered, but not all of them will really work. One of the solutions that our county and state officials are looking at happens to be a, a program based upon Singapore's model of housing, in which the government itself owns the land in the building and leases out land, uh, leases out uh, apartments to residents. That may be a short-term fix, but in the long run, we think there are some serious problems with it. But we don't want to be naysayers. At the Grassroot Institute, we want to come up with solutions that will work, and so we scour the country and the world for those solutions. One such solution may very well come from Tokyo. The highly populated city has shown that deregulation, rather than more government management, can help communities keep up with the housing demand. So if Hawaii wants more housing, it may wish to follow Tokyo's example and roll back regulations and or on land use and housing development. My guest today is an expert in this subject matter. He's senior fellow and director at the American Enterprise Institute Housing Center in Washington, D.C. His name is Edward Pinto, and I'm so glad that he's joining us today to give us a bit of his expertise. Ed, welcome to the program. Aloha, and thank you for having me. Well, Ed, I can't wait until you fly out here to Hawaii, and we don't have to do this on Zoom. How's that sound? We we're planning on doing that. That sounds great. Tell me a little bit about your background in the subject matter and, and what, why you have an interest in what we call the Tokyo model. So I've been involved in housing finance uh, literally my entire career, even before I graduated law school. Uh, I was involved in housing a bit. I was involved in it at law school. And then my first job was in uh, working for the State Housing Finance Agency as an attorney um, and in affordable housing. And so that's been my entire career. Uh, I was the chief credit officer uh, and executive vice president at Fannie Mae back in the 1980s. And for the last um, 14 years, I've been a uh, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and I founded the uh, uh, American, the Housing Center back in 2013. And the purpose of the Housing Center is to uh, study housing markets in the United States on a data-based and research-based way, we've assembled what we believe is the best uh, uh, data set in the entire country about the United States, uh, including all 50 states. And uh, we use those data to come up with solutions. We call it uh, data yields information, information yields knowledge, and knowledge yields potential uh, action. And, uh, and we do a lot of research and we've looked at Tokyo and many other uh, situations that might be applicable and useful to Hawaii. Well, I like your emphasis on data uh, because we, we can't simply have an ideology or a philosophy. We really have to look at the world as it is in order to find causes to the problems and solutions. One of the th things at the Grassroot Institute that we have recognized for quite a while is that many people are leaving Hawaii uh, because of the high cost of living and the most significant component of that is the high cost of housing and for those who remain in the state uh, there, there is a high population of those of residents who don't own their home and don't have security in terms of long-term residency now you've looked at the states across the nation as you look at hawaii what do you think are some of the causes or perhaps even the chief cause of the high cost of housing First of all, as you say, that Hawaii does have a high cost. We looked at, out of all the states, Hawaii has the highest median home income, the second highest median rents, uh, the second highest rate of homelessness per capita. On a national basis, uh, it is extraordinarily high from a, a price to in median income basis. Uh, and uh, out of 92 international markets, uh, Honolulu is number 86 and it ranks uh, just behind San Francisco and San Jose and is ahead of London and San Diego in terms of being one of the most expensive international destinations. What uh, we think basically creates this problem, and it's a very similar problem that California has, and many of the cities that are similarly ranked to Honolulu are in California, and there's a reason for that. California and Honolulu followed similar patterns, which was to put in land use restrictions, zoning, 
uh, land use containment zones, uh, other restrictions on uh, types of structures, uh, restrictions on density uh, beyond zoning, uh, restrictions on building codes, et cetera, that have been present in California from the 50s and 60s and in <clears throat> Honolulu and Hawaii since the early 1970s. And, and so we see a very similar pattern between uh, California and, and Honolulu and Hawaii. And what's interesting about uh, California and a colleague of mine, uh, the assistant director at the housing center, uh, Tobias Peter and I wrote an op-ed a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, where we pointed out that after uh, trying all the other op uh, options, the state of California is now finally embracing the free market and property rights. And they did that two ways. One is they, over a period of years, greatly expanded the ability to build accessory dwelling units, um, which are now burgeoning throughout much of California, particularly Los Angeles and San Francisco. And secondly, just last year, late last year, took effect January 1st this year, they legalized uh, the building of a second unit, which could be either a second single unit or a duplex two family and lot splitting of, of individual lots throughout about 80% of California. And that took effect just uh, in January of this year. And so if California has recognized that they need to allow the private sector and the uh, property rights to operate, it's time for uh, Hawaii and Honolulu to do the same. Well, Ed, that's very interesting. And in my own opinion, I, I'm not so certain as to how much California as a state or state government is acknowledging the philosophy of property rights and principles of individual property ownership, but they, they've been pushed there at the very least. Uh, what California had been doing just wasn't working, and so pragmatic solutions are necessary. Just to go back a bit, you said such uh, interesting things uh, about the role government plays in interfering with housing availability. Uh, talking about the Hawaii situation, would you say that government regulation is a big part of reducing the supply of housing, which leads to its high cost? Absolutely. And, and we found some data that show that uh, Honolulu and uh, individually and other uh, islands, uh, uh, counties and islands in uh, Hawaii had robust housing construction up until uh, about the 1972 or 1973, and then it collapsed after that, and it's never recovered. It's been declining ever since. And uh, we attribute that to uh, a number of things, the State Environmental Policy Act of 1974, the impact of the Land Use uh, Commission that was established in the 60s. Interestingly, this is very similar to what happened in California in the 60s and early 70s, which in California, in, in uh, coastal California had a decline that even predates what happened in, uh, in uh, Hawaii, uh, but starting in the early 70s, interior California started having substantial declines also. So again, we see a lot of parallels and it all comes down to um, land use and making things illegal. Basically building new housing has been made illegal. Uh, reasonable density, we call it light touch density has been made illegal. Um, having uh, two units on a lot is illegal. Um, and, and all of these things just drive up the cost. They drive up the land cost. And now Honolulu has land costs that are commensurate with the, the price per acre that California has. And again, if you, if you force the land cost up artificially, then that's going to force the price of the housing up. You talk about forcing the land cost up artificially. Uh, I like to think of it also as producing an artificial scarcity of land. We like to say that the reason that housing is so expensive is that land is scarce in Hawaii, but our own research shows that we actually develop on about ninety, about 5%, only 5% of the land mass, leaving 95% undeveloped. Regulations tend to have that, that effect. Uh, what, what do you say to people who say we, we have a scarcity of land? I don't believe there's a scarcity of land at all. The United States of any country in the world should have housing that is economical. We have more land and we've only you know used for residential purposes, you cite uh, Hawaii at 5% uh, 
uh, the, I think for the country, it's probably even less. Uh, and we have lots and lots of land compared to virtually any other developed country in the world. We have tons and tons of land. That's number one. And, and I agree with the suggestion that the Grassroot Institute has made that by freeing up just one or two percentage points of the land that's not available for residential, for uh, uh, it's not even residential construction, it's not developed. The rest of the land, the other 95% is agricultural and conser in conservation. And so if you were to increase from five to, to 7% or a 40% increase in the amount of land that's available, uh, that would drive down the cost of housing tremendously uh, in Hawaii. But secondly, the land that is that 5%, we've looked at that <clears throat> and we have found that uh, the zoning and the residential zoning is what we're talking about. And it's usually called 3,500 uh, 3 or 3.5, 5 and 7.5, which has to do roughly with the lot size and the required square footage for, for a structure. And what we found was that while technically uh, two family housing houses are available to be built on that, you can build it within the zoning. Uh, however, the uh, density that's required is usually 50 to 100% more land. Well, that defeats the whole purpose. If you're on a lot of 5,000 square feet and you wanna put uh, two, two family rather than one on it, uh, you now need 7,500 or 10,000 square feet in order to build that. Well, that drives the cost rate back up. So we've calculated that if you were to have uh, uh, triplexes allowed broadly, in these uh, 3.55 and 7.5 residential zones, which is most of what, for example, Honolulu County is owned as, um, or those three zones. If you were to allow uh, the uh, triplexes, duplexes and triplexes and lot splitting, which allows you to take a 7,500 square foot lot and divide it in two, you could add 26,000 units over an estimated 10 years. Well, that's a, that would go a long way to meeting the shortage that the uh, Hawaii realtors say, uh, I think is uh, something like 80,000 uh, units. And so we think there's lots of land options. It's just, you have to make it legal and you have to free up the land. Well, Ed, we both recognize the role that government regulation is playing in creating this artificial scarcity. And there are a lot of practical solutions that, that are available. Uh, yet it seems a little bit dismaying at times that uh, legislators are, are looking at solutions that have practical problems to them. One is a, a solution called the Singapore model. You're, you're familiar with that, uh, and a couple of the features include the fact that it's the government uh, acting as the landlord, uh, leasing out uh, apartments uh, to people who don't really have uh, a wealth generating capacity in terms of being able to buy these as fee simple. Uh, I could go on with some of the features of this model, but what are your thoughts about it and its, its suitability for the Hawaii market? Well, uh, just to uh, be uh, uh, very succinct about it, I don't believe it is uh, feasible for the uh, Hawaiian market. Um, it is appealing. Why is it appealing? Well, Singapore has a home ownership rate of 80%. That's very high. 80% um, of the residents live in high quality uh, housing uh, that is really high rise flats that were developed by the government. Um, however, Singapore is um, a, a very cohesive society. It has racial uh, cohesion and uh, income quotas that are associated with uh, Singapore housing. It has a, um, a, the housing is relatively affordable through a program that's funded like Social Security. There's a large tax that everyone uh, pays uh, that's used to cross subsidize. Uh, and most importantly, perhaps, uh, there are strong macro prudential regulations, regulations by the government. Uh, foreigners and those buying second homes can be charged increasingly large uh, duties. And uh, you also uh, have uh, the fact that the, um, uh, uh, the government is a, uh, a city state, unlike Hawaii, which is a state within a federal system and Hawaii uh, County is a county within a state. 
of the city state with an authoritarian form of government and a highly effective public leadership cadre that goes back. Uh, it's a one roughly one party system that goes back decades and decades. Uh, the government owns the land and therefore they're able to put this in place on a very small, what is in effect a small city state that uh, they control virtually every lever in the state. We think if that were tried in uh, Hawaii, uh, A, it might not be able to be scaled. That's a big, big question. It would take a very, very long time, which I don't have a big problem with that because anything to solve this problem is gonna take a while, but the failure could come at a very heavy cost. Yes. Uh, we, it, it could be like the public housing uh, debacle that we had in the United States um, that was a disaster. That was a combination of federal, state, and local uh, efforts. The United States has a history of failing in these uh, buildings supplied by the government. Uh, it's expensive to build, and particularly, I think, in Hawaii or any state, because there's going to be uh, unionization requirements, Davis-Bacon requirements, other things that, that require that the housing be very expensive. And there's also a history in the United States, unlike probably Singapore, where things are not done within budget. Uh, we all know about the, the bridge to nowhere. We know about the, the train that's in California that's three or four or five times over budget. We know about the big dig in, uh, in uh, Boston. Uh, it also, lastly, I think, isn't really what's needed by the tenants. It, it really traps the tenants. Once they're in, they, they really have a little limited ability to move. Uh, they're not really building equity in the traditional sense, uh, thereby reducing mobility and really reducing wealth creation. And I'm not a big fan of, of unbridled house price appreciation driven by government policies, but I am a fan of building wealth the old fashioned way, which is you take out a loan, you pay it off and you get equity. And that's the way it should be. Well, Ed, we tend to view the Singapore model in the same light, uh, but he, we don't want to be naysayers. Uh, when government leaders propose something, uh, we commend them for trying to find a solution. But what we'd like to suggest is there may be solutions elsewhere. Tokyo, on the other hand, uh, could very well have an approach that could be used here that involves the private sector rather than the government. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the Tokyo model? Yes, and uh, we can bring up that uh, uh, graphic now. Uh, so this is a change in house price and population over uh, a 20 year period for uh, four cities, uh, London, Tokyo, I'm not actually sure where uh, this uh, Minato Ku is, and then San Francisco. Uh, but what you see is the blue bar are house prices uh, and, and nominal prices and the orange bar um, are the is population and you see that population uh, let's focus on London Tokyo and San Francisco has barely grown in any of the the three but the house prices have gone up tremendously four and a half times in London and um, well over double in San Francisco and that was just through 2015 it's, it's gotten worse since whereas Tokyo the house prices are actually basically flat and uh, a population is roughly flat also we have other data, and, and, and what happened in Tokyo was under their constitution, uh, which was set up by the United States government after World War II, it provided property rights, and those property rights were finally recognized pretty fully in the 1980s, and part of the property rights was that you could develop your property um, as long as it basically wasn't disturbing someone else. Uh, it wasn't a nuisance, and so you could build uh, there was very lim tremendous limitations on zoning. You could build um, a more intense development next to a, a lower intensity development. Uh, you could build duplexes, quadruplexes, triplexes, high rise buildings. And so uh, as a result, Honolulu has built, uh, uh, excuse me, I, I mean, uh, Tokyo has, has built more housing than uh, in a period than the entire state of California by a multiple. Uh, and so, uh, Tokyo has been able to meet the needs of their uh, population, uh, meet the needs in terms of a cost, keep, the, keep it affordable, uh, both for rents and home ownership. Uh, the units have actually gotten larger over time because uh, that's one thing they were well known for was relatively small units. They've gotten somewhat larger, uh, whereas everything's going in the opposite direction in a place like San Francisco and Honolulu. 
Ed, what are some of the quick takeaways that Hawaii can learn from the Tokyo model and apply? I think the quick takeaways are you have to make development legal. And uh, now there may be uh, a desire not to allow high rise construction everywhere, but you should be looking at what is the price of land? And we already have talked about the fact that these prices are made artificially high, uh, high through scarcity, but that's the situation we're in is high priced land. And so if you look at the land um, around the uh, uh, H1 highway uh, on, the, on the ocean side, <clears throat> the water side, um, that's very high density development, but a lot of that, <clears throat> excuse me, very high priced land, but a lot of that is still just zoned for residential development on 3,500, 5,000 and 7,500 uh, square foot lots. Uh, that area with those land prices needs to be opened up for more intensive development and redevelopment. On the other side of H1, that's also zoned the same way. That needs to be opened up for effective uh, duplex and I would add triplex development. Well, again, what we found was that while you can legally build a duplex, the amount of land that you need is 50% more in some instances, 100% more in the others, which defeats the whole purpose. If you need more land to build the extra units, you're going to go with the monster houses and with the McMansions, as they're called. Uh, that's what you're going to build because that's the highest and best use of that property. So what, what uh, Hawaii needs to do is allow other uses that take advantage of this high land cost, spread it over more density. In some cases, that can be uh, high rise density as in Tokyo. In other cases, it could be what we call light touch density, uh, which includes <clears throat> uh, two units on a lot, lot splitting, things like uh, eight accessory dwelling units, duplexes, triplexes, cottage homes, all kinds of townhouses. These are all things that could be done. And as I said, we think that in the case of um, Oahu would add 26,000 units uh, over a 10 year period, just reutilizing some of the existing land. Now, Ed, you've just written a paper on light touch density and you've listed some of the ideas in that paper. I anything uh, that's particularly relevant to the Hawaii situation? Yes, uh, <clears throat> what we've we've looked at a number of, uh, of natural experiments, as we call them. One is Palisades Park, New Jersey, which happens to be where I grew up. And uh, I was driving through there one day and I happened to uh, then go to uh, Google and I was Googling Palisades Park. And I noticed that the population uh, had almost doubled from when I lived there in the late 60s. And went, wait a minute, it kind of looks the same. It doesn't have high rise development. What, what went on here? And I, it took me a while to figure out. It turns out that uh, Palisades Park, you know, from their initial zoning law, allowed uh, duplexes on equal footing with uh, single family detached homes. And so duplex homes and single family detached at equal footing. And uh, while that's not the way Palisades Park developed initially, it was fully developed, um, but it, it eventually, as the land prices went up, um, the uh, owners and, and builders found that they could tear down the homes and build duplexes uh, or two family houses. And that was a more effective use. That had all kinds of positive ripple effects. Um, not only did it rebuild much of the uh, housing <clears throat> that was getting very old and was energy inefficient, et cetera, it also uh, greatly added to the tax base of Palisades Park because you now had uh, two units on the same lot that used to have one and also increased the value of the commercial properties um, that in their commercial district um, because now you had uh, about 80% more customers within walking distance of those same areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a walkable area. And, and so there were just lots and lots of, of uh, benefits from this, in addition to being a walkable area, which is, is healthy. Um, and so we viewed those as, as lots of benefits and we can show how the town next door had a completely different uh, result. We can also show another town is much like Honolulu on paper, the town says you can build a duplex at pretty much anywhere in that town. In reality, very few get built. Why? They require twice as much land as a single family home. Therefore, oh. economically not viable. 
There you go. You know, we've got a couple of minutes left and just winding down, uh, you referred to some of the developments in California recently uh, that hopefully could translate into changes in Hawaii. California passed SB9 that allows uh, a lot that traditionally was for one house to have multiple houses. In closing, how can we see these changes brought about in the political climate in Hawaii? What, what are some of the best approaches to convince our government? I think the, the best approach is to A, build a coalition of those that would benefit from this. And I just went through in the Palisades Park case, there's a lot of different people that would benefit from this. You've got homeowners who now have something worth something. Their, their land has a potential option to be used in another use and has value. Um, the, um, you've got the uh, impact on taxes, property taxes uh, can be lower. You've got the impact on commercial development. You have the impact on builders and developers and subcontractors and all the other people that would be involved. And you have an impact on um, the uh, uh, workers that are service workers of which uh, Hawaii has one of the highest percentage of service workers in, right. in the country. Uh, they need places to live and ADUs. There's a lot of research out of California that shows how ADUs have relatively low rents compared to uh, other uh, similar sized apartments. And you're adding in areas that are close to jobs. Those are other opportunities. So there's lots of opportunities to build a coalition uh, among the willing and actually overcome the, the nimbyism uh, that you'd otherwise uh, uh, run into. Uh, and that's happening around the country. You mentioned California, uh, you, uh, it's happening in Oregon, it's happening in um, uh, uh, Minneapolis and many other places where they're embracing light touch density. Well, Ed, that's a great idea. And thanks for all the research you do, your insights, and we look forward to working more with you. Um, thank you for being on the program, Ed. Appreciate my pleasure. Thank my, you. My, my guest today has been Edward Pinto of the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute for Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii's broadcast network. Until next time, Aloha.